Great. So um, thank you all very much for joining me. Um, this is the first of two welcomes you'll actually get from me this afternoon. Uh, this first one, I just want to remind everyone that this has been streamed uh, direct to YouTube. And if you want to interact, if you want to uh, ask questions, please do that via the Q and A function. And on Twitter, we are using the, the hashtag Global Shocks uh, to refer to this presentation. So let's see if this works. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I'm David Roberts, I'm the lead in regional security and development here at King's College London in the School of Security Studies. Um, this afternoon, for the next 90 minutes or so, we'll have a series of presentations and then a few questions, hopefully, about the impact on the military of the COVID crisis, perhaps on civil military relations more specifically. Um, to do this, we are going to have a tour de force of case studies from around the world. We have three of our best and brightest PhD students who will offer a... So good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Apologies for the technical snafu. Let me try this one more time from the top. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share my computer sound and off we go. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for teaching fellows. Uh, leading experts um, in, in their fields who will look at Italy and in Europe more generally before Professor Bricknell from War Studies, former Surgeon General of the UK, rounds this up, um, offering us some thoughts about NATO uh, and some concluding ideas. Uh, if technology is our friend, what will transpire is I shall disappear shortly. There will be a consecutive five or six videos of these short presentations and then there'll be time for questions and answers at the end. Use the question answer function built into Zoom, drop me an email. I think we all know how these things work to some degree these days. And let's hope all the technology works. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. I'm Natasha Boychenko, the PGR representative for our research team. In this presentation, I will examine the impact COVID-19 has made on Ukraine's military. First, I will discuss Ukraine's bottom line, then examine what Ukraine is doing to combat the crisis. After, I'll delve into the underlying problems or the why Ukraine is focusing on immediate security and defense. Finally, I'll calculate the so what implications and roughly discuss how Ukraine's military might look post COVID-19. To put it simply, the armed forces of Ukraine maintains focus on combat operations and utilizing military tactics, which focus on the country's immediate security and defense, even in the face of a pandemic. Adapting to coronavirus is actually not the Ukrainian military's main priority, as they are still fighting to survive and maintain control of the East. They are trying to recapture land taken by the Russian-backed separatists, re-establish legitimacy in the region, and ultimately secure state borders. The Ukrainian army currently has two main antagonists then, coronavirus and the Russian-backed rebels. The close quarters in the barracks of active trench warfare make social distancing a near impossible task. They are imposing stricter health measures and constantly preparing for surges in coronavirus cases in the war zone. So let's jump into some of the situational data. I chose statistics reported by Ukraine's cabinet of ministers. The data represents three of the 24 oblasts. Think of them as states or provinces. The Donetsk oblast is the largest in Ukraine as far as population and also happens to be the area of contention. It reported the fewest cases and deaths compared to the capital, Kiev, and Chernisti, which is the smallest oblast, but reported the most corona cases in the country. There could be various reasons for this, but most obviously it's just too difficult to trace and test COVID-19 cases in the war zone, posing major risk to soldiers on the front lines. So as stated, the violent conflict compels the armed forces of Ukraine to primarily focus on state defense. It would be unethical and irresponsible, however, if the Ukrainian military did not shift slightly to combat the COVID pandemic. First, though, a bit of a background of the conflict. Ukraine has been in a personal crisis since 2014, when after the pro-Russian president pulled out of an EU referendum, the people toppled the government. Russia responded by annexing Crimea and creating a war of attrition, utilizing insurgents groups and separatist fighters on the eastern border in the Donetsk Oblast. In the past six years, 
The conflict in eastern Ukraine has killed nearly 14,000 people and left chunks of Ukraine's territory de facto occupied by Russian-backed separatists. It subsequently has also become the biggest armed conflict in Europe since World War II and the greatest source of east-west tensions since the Cold War. In early March, President Vladimir Zelensky fired most of his cabinet, although coronavirus likely did not play a huge role in this decision. Notably, the March 4th appointment to Mr. Andriy Taron as the Minister of Defense demonstrates a more drastic shift in Ukraine's military strategy towards international integration. Mr. Taron participated in the anti-terrorist operation in the Donetsk and Minesk regions, so he has been vital to integrating counterinsurgency and counterterrorism tactics into Ukraine's military strategy. More importantly, on the 23rd of March, the Euro-Atlantic Disaster Response Coordination Center received a call for international assistance from the armed forces of Ukraine. Consisting of NATO allies and partner countries, this special division is NATO's principal civil emergency response mechanism in the Euro-Atlantic area. And they answered by asking international partners to aid the Ministry of Defense in supplying humanitarian assistance to help prevent the spread of the virus in the military units of the armed forces. Even in the COVID age, this approach to international relations and the military perfectly ties into the new minister's 2020 objective to expand combat capabilities. In his own words, to maximize the ability of the armed forces of Ukraine to interoperate with NATO, as well as expedite technological modernization using the latest technologies and the building of thought out weapons development system. As stated earlier, many examples exist of the military adjusting to work side by side with civilians to combat COVID. And really, this is where we see the much improved civil military relations. Firstly, Ukraine's Ministry of Defense, like many countries around the world, reached out to retired military personnel and medical students, calling for joint activities to tackle cases of the coronavirus infection. In particular, the Army reached out to over 800,000 veterans with specific medical skills to return for duty and help train volunteers assisting to combat COVID in the conflict zones. It's worth mentioning that the reserve forces are also automatically regarded active status to combat the virus. The Joint Forces Operation, deployed on the Eastern Front, also said it had produced their own four mobile hospitals containing about 250 beds and 45 ventilators for potential coronavirus patients, both military and civilian, in the immediate conflict zones. The Ukrainian Air Force is combating the disease by transporting shipments of medical cargo from China, such as COVID infection tests and kits. The Ministry of Defense successfully facilitated cooperation between local authorities and military unit commanders when the pandemic jeopardized the food supply chain of about 30% Ukrainian armed force personnel. And lastly, the National Guard's mission has also shifted to policing and patrolling the streets of highly populated cities, like the capital, and are authorized to arrest people who violate the lockdown quarantine rules which are extended to June 22nd, Although, as of yet, I don't have any data showing that arrests have been made. Now, let's talk about the underlying causes as to why it's imperative that Ukraine focus on self-defense. Even in the midst of pandemic, the violence rages intensely. The picture above shows Minister Tron visiting wounded soldiers on April 29th. Additionally, the Military Times cited a report describing the carnage on both sides between March 4th and March 24th a time when most of the country and the world were entering lockdown conditions. In it, they registered over 30 troops killed and 60 wounded. It states the enemy continues to use heavy weapons, anti-tank missile systems, and counted a total of 170 shellings. The daily struggle remains in these war-torn areas for civilians and military alike, and that was before adding a deadly coronavirus. In the past six years, the biggest component of Ukraine's strategy has been rebuilding their military capabilities. Ukraine is an incredibly weak or fragile state when pit against a hostile and coercive neighbor like Russia. And since 2014, Ukraine has dedicatedly attempted to rebuild its military presence. A quintessential example of the military existing for state survival comes with the reestablishment of their National Guard only five days before Russia formally incorporated Crimea as subjects of the Russian Federation. Additionally, they had to rebuild their navy after Russia seized most of their military vessels. 
Even before COVID, Ukraine faced many problems in generating maritime capabilities, specifically economic challenges and the ability to implement effective policy and strategy. Lastly, the role of Ukraine's military cannot shift from focusing on state security because diplomacy and international peace efforts constantly fail. While there have been many attempts to bring Russia to justice over their actions in Ukraine and Crimea, such as the Minsk agreements, international sanctions, shaming by the United Nations to name a few, they have all been in vain. Most recently in December 2019, France hosted the Normandy Conference, the first engagement in which newly elected President Zelensky met face to face with his aggressive neighbor, President Vladimir Putin. Negotiations were successful in possibly warming the relations between the two countries, but accomplished little to nothing in actually stopping the bloodshed. One of the outcomes of the summit was to meet again in four months, making the next round of talks sometime in April, which of course did not occur. Additionally, the United Nations tried to get enemies around the world to see the pandemic as the world's common enemy. And in late March, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, called for an immediate global ceasefire in all corners of the world. He stated, it is time to put armed conflict on lockdown and focus together on the true fight of our lives. Obviously, this did not deter Russian aggression either. So what does this all mean, especially when predicting the new normal for Ukraine's armed forces in a post-COVID world? First off, it is likely that most of the COVID-19 adaptations are here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. I predict there will be much more cooperation between local authorities and the military, adapting a more modern model utilizing strong civil military relations. This will be most vital moving forward in determining how to reopen the country, much less reopen the war zone. Ultimately, though, the military goals are unchanged. The armed forces remain the key element to deter the ongoing Russian aggression and to ensure security in the Black Sea and the Zav area. According to Ukraine's Ministry of Defense, the ultimate goal of Ukraine is to return all its temporarily occupied territories, stop Russian military aggression, and restore international order and peace. While COVID-19 is a huge strain on resources, it will strain the country's abilities. It isn't going to stop this fundamental objective. Even now, we do not have any idea how COVID-19 is going to affect the Eurasia region, economically, politically, or militarily. And while I don't want to focus on Russia, it's important to note that the Russian Federation is also facing extraordinary circumstances and difficulties. As the greatest challenge to Ukraine's military and autonomy, their struggles with Corona could be a welcome reprieve for Ukraine's military and civilians in the conflict zones. If Russia's economy becomes severely crippled, then they might finally have to end their campaign in Ukraine. There is one silver lining stemming from the potential effects of coronavirus too, that Ukraine could utilize the pandemic and come out stronger in the contended area. This is a test not only of how the military can exert force and therefore control, but also how well the government can provide services and regain legitimacy in an area where the separatists fight for autonomy. If Ukraine can provide effective virus response, especially before the weakened breakaway authorities manage to do so, they may reestablish legitimacy with longer term implications for the politics of war and hopefully a speedier end to the conflict as a whole. To wrap up, the coronavirus pandemic in Ukraine made an already catastrophic situation even bleaker. It gravely challenges Ukraine's military, a military defined by their goals to ensure state survival. Now, they are also resolved to adapt to the shifting dynamics of a post-COVID world. Thank you for listening. I cannot wait to hear from you all in the Q&A section. Good morning. I am Dr. Ben Sanimat from the Defense Studies Department of King's College London. And today I am going to talk about how the COVID-19 crisis has affected civil military relations in Europe. And especially, I would like to talk about how the core roles, the core functions of European armed forces have been affected by this crisis. The short answer to this question is that the COVID-19 crisis has been accelerating already undergoing trends and shifts regarding the core roles of European armed forces. Until recently, European militaries focused on expeditionary tasks like peacekeeping or expeditionary warfighting. But for the last five years, 
uh, we could see that uh, uh, European militaries uh, were involved more and more in tasks at home or closer at home, and they concentrated less and less on expeditionary tasks. And the military responses to the COVID-19 crisis in Europe basically fits to this trend. So what happened? European armed forces were mobilized to help to manage the COVID-19 crisis domestically. Uh, we could see throughout Europe, most European armed forces uh, contributed to the efforts to manage the COVID-19 crisis. And it was very similar to the migration crisis in 2015 and the terrorist attacks uh, for the last couple of years, when militaries played a supportive role to other uh, civilian authorities, they played a crucial role, but they were not the most significant or the primary actors in managing this crisis. And this happened with the COVID-19 crisis as well. Uh, European Armed Forces provided uh, support on two key areas, mostly. These were logistical and medical support. And uh, some European Armed Forces also provided uh, or contributed to internal security tasks as well. But I am not going to talk about this uh, in this video because uh, it uh, were not a Europe-wide phenomenon, just some countries uh, use their militaries for this. But almost every European Armed Forces basically provided this logistical and medical support. Logistical support was very crucial, um, especially uh, the airlift capabilities played very important role in certain countries, for instance, in UK and France, military helicopters and uh, military uh, aircrafts uh, transported patients. Uh, between hospitals and also uh, critical equipments like protective personal equipments as well. And also military aircrafts were used to bring citizens home uh, when they trapped abroad. And uh, here the military is played also a very crucial role. In terms of medical support, of course, military medical personnel were assigned to support the civilian authorities. And for instance, here in the UK, the British Army be at the Nightingale uh, Hospital, which is a field hospital and uh, has a capacity of 500 bed. And also originally it was planned that six other field hospitals uh, would be built throughout the UK. But for instance, in Spain, the, the Spanish military built 16 field hospitals and also the two major military hospitals accepted COVID-19 uh, patients as well. Um, so we can see that on these, three, on these two areas, basically European Armed Forces provided very significant support. Also NATO and EU supported the member states. These are the two most relevant international organizations in Europe that, uh, that uh, uh, are relevant in uh, defense matters. EU established uh, a European task force fighting COVID-19 and coordinated European level, EU level efforts in this regard. And need to use its own procedures and system to make sure that the military uh, aircrafts, for instance, transport aircrafts, uh, could uh, fly uh, faster or, or with less administrative tasks between the different countries to make sure that the, the critical equipment could be delivered to those countries that uh, needed the most. So why it is happening that uh, militaries are involved in civilian crisis management situations? And uh, basically, not only in terms of the COVID-19 crisis, but also in, 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 in the migration crisis or, or, or after terrorist attacks, uh, oftentimes civilian resources are, are insufficient and uh, very quickly raise their capacity limits. So um, civilian authorities, are, do, do not always plan for major crisis. They are not anticipating such kind of crisis like the COVID-19. And, uh, and the military is there. It has a structure, the potential, the equipment, and also the personnel. I think it is the most crucial part here, the personnel that is ready at short notice to give support. And the militaries have wide ranging of capabilities, as I mentioned, medical, logistical, also, also CBRN, so chemical, biological uh, contamination can be handled by military capabilities. So there is a flexible set of capabilities the militaries have and they are there and can jump in when it is necessary. Um, of course, political oversight is very important when militaries are involved in domestic tasks, 
but in Europe, uh, the civil control, civilian control is very strong, and also the military personnel is very conscious about uh, the pitfalls, or possible pitfalls in this regard. So here in Europe, I don't see uh, uh, significant problems in this regard. So the question emerges, so what? So in 2006, Timothy Edmonds published a very influential a paper titled What are Armed Forces For? And he pointed out that armed forces have four main roles. Uh, the defense of national territory, expeditionary tasks, internal security related tasks, and nation building. Nation building can be symbolic and also we can understand it very literally. For instance, when the militaries are building critical infrastructure or just right now with hospitals. And, uh, and uh, Timothy Edmund Edmonds highlighted that time that, uh, that expeditionary tasks became the, the priority for European armed forces in the 90s, in the 1990s and in the 2000s. And the other tasks remained there, but uh, their significance uh, became uh, on a very low, low level. However, what we can see now um, uh, that uh, these shifts have been cha changing again. So, now the expedition tasks, uh, their importance are becoming relatively a little bit lower, and the other task, a task becoming uh, relatively more important uh, throughout Europe. For instance, for those countries who uh, share border with Russia, the defense of national territory became very, very important after uh, the Ukraine crisis in 2015. Uh, internal security became very important for those countries who suffered terrorist attacks. For instance, in France, 10,000 troops are deployed to the uh, French streets to prevent uh, further terrorist attacks. Nation building also became very important, for instance, for those countries who uh, experienced uh, the 2015 migration crisis and uh, the militaries were used to build uh, border fences and pass the borders. And now we can see that in the COVID-19 crisis, a similar thing happened, that uh, in many cases, militaries were used uh, as a nation building, uh, uh, supporting element, and also occasionally they were used as internal security, uh, uh, that they had to support internal security as well. So what does it mean in the future? Uh, for instance, here in the UK, we will have a defense review, uh, probably in the second half of this year. and. Uh, and if we see the trends for the last five years, we can see that uh, that relatively the relevance of warfighting capabilities have been declining. So when uh, decisions have to be made, which capabilities should be supported more, probably logistics capabilities and medical capabilities will have a, a very good argument um, to be made why they are needed. And probably warfighting capabilities have a little bit less relevance in this regard. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask it during the Q&A. Good morning. I am Maritza Padilla, a PhD candidate in War Studies, and I belong to the Regional Security and Development Group. Currently, with the worldwide event of COVID-19, it has provoked a lot of discussions about the topic on the utilization of the military to help encounter the pandemic. This topic is related to my research, which is about civil-military relations in Colombia and Brazil. Then, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about, first, uh, a context on civil-military relations theories. Second, the understanding of civil-military relations in Colombia and Brazil. Third, the approach of Colombia and Brazil to combat COVID-19. Then, how this approach is different to some of the global North countries. And finally, why after the COVID-19 civil-military relations might change. What? According to the mainstream theory of civil-military relations proposed by Huntington in 1957. CMR are the subordination of the military to the civilian power and how the military should just understand about war and the politicians about politics. In 1960, Janowitz agreed with Huntington nevertheless not completely. 
He added that in order to defend the democracy of a country, the military should know about politics so that they can understand the mandates of the civilian power and achieve their objectives for the sake of the nation. Both academics wrote their theories based mainly on the examples of the United States, but also used Germany and France as reference. Generally, their examples are from the global north, with the exception of Japan. Since then, both ideas of CMR are the umbrella for the topic. A wide range of academics have been writing about CMR, agreeing or not with Huntington and Janowitz. One of the arguments of some of the academics opposed that both theories said that they do not fit in some countries or situations, as it happened to the United States in the Vietnam and Afghanistan wars. Another argument is that the description of CMR fits mainly for the Western countries, mostly the ones in North America and Western Europe. Therefore, what other academics have argued is that civil military relations are not as they have been described. It's not only about the relationships between the military and, and the civilian power, but also about the links between the military and the entire society. Around the world, the militaries have the duty to defend the sovereignty of the country which they belong to. In the case of the Global North armies, the majority of them work uh, in wars overseas. Consequently, the citizens in their own countries might not be used to see them deploy in internal missions in the streets. However, this is very different in countries such as Colombia or Brazil, in which the military duty to defend the sovereignty starts in their own territory. They have both security and development roles. As a result, they have to defend the security inside the country. Since they were created, they have to carry out both the armed and non-armed task needed to protect the population from internal conflict or crime. Therefore, the militaries in these countries complete tasks in order to protect the economy, social, politics, and cultural assets. It's not unusual to see militaries in Colombia and Brazil in duties related to the protection of public security, education, public health, culture, environment, and even work among others. Then, aside of the fact that they have to maintain the public order and the security inside the country, they also need to achieve other obligations. I am not saying that Colombia and Brazil are the same, but they share a particular understanding of CMR, which is not the same to Global North, and these made them suitable examples to explain my point. For instance, the militaries in both countries help with a variety of tasks, such as the development or of infrastructure by the construction of roads, in public health by providing medical attention to the population, in education by building schools and teaching, in politics by providing security to the citizens, which allow them to vote in peace protecting the, the environment by developing uh, operations to preserve the Amazon, avoiding illegal mining or disasters relief. All those civilian tasks made the civil-military relations in Colombia and Brazil far different from the ones in the Western countries I mentioned. The relationship is so different to the point that the population asks for the presence of the militaries in cities and towns or rural areas even over the presence of the police in order to feel safe. In both countries, according to academics and well-known surveys such as Gallup, Datafola, and Ivope, the military forces are the most trusted governmental organization. Since the declaration of the pandemic COVID-19, the military launched Operación San Roque in Colombia and Operación COVID-19 in Brazil. The military operations are aimed 
to help to counter the spreading of the virus and to mitigate the consequences. All these by providing logistics resources, such as vehicles, helicopters, planes, and boats by delivering medicines, water, biosecurity elements, food, as well as fumigation, and their industries are now producing a variety of elements for medical care. On the other hand, around the world, we have seen that some countries have decided to use their military forces in tasks, such as contain their population inside their homes, like Spain, Italy, or China, investigate the virus like you, the US, China, or Korea, or run COVID tests uh, like the UK. When countries like the USA, Spain, and the UK decided to use their military to help fight COVID-19. In social media, you were able to see the reaction of the people saying that they were kind of scared to see the military in the street. This might be because they are not used to see the military in their cities. On the other side, there were examples of the US military in social media saying that they are used to picking up bodies in war, but not to pick them up in their own hometowns. Consequently, it can be noticed that the way in which civil military relations have been developing during the pandemic might provoke a change in the topic. Why? From now on, CMR might change. First, because the mentality of the population in the global north countries might change about how they feel by seeing the military working inside their countries. Second, academics, politicians, and the military might have reconsidered where CMR stand nowadays. So what? A pandemic is a risk for national security. The theory needs to be broadened and to understand and explain that. CMR transcend the military subordination to the civilian power, as well as their relation to the military with the political power of the nation. The military have relationships with the civilian society. The military know about politics and are involved with it, but in such a manner that doesn't harm democracy. Nowadays, the military perform the armed and non-armed task. The military can complete duties inside and outside their countries. Humanitarian assistance is an essential part of the military duty. Finally, it is important that both politicians and academic actors keep observing the topic in order to prevent that in context in which the democracy is weak, it becomes as an excuse for the military to take over the power. My research might be relevant in the context of Colombia and Brazil. First, because it analyzed the model of the presence and the participation of the military forces in tasks that are not related to war. And second, it shows how the military participate in those civilian activities without this representing an insubordination to the political power. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Michele Groppi. I am a teaching fellow at King's College London. Today, we're going to be talking about the role of the Italian military in the age of COVID-19. However, before doing that, uh, we have to be able to understand what the Italian military is all about. And therefore, we're going to be mentioning the post-World War II period, international missions and domestic aid. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to be able to focus on how COVID-19 is affecting the actions of the military. And then we're going to conclude with future scenarios. Even though generalizations decay, and it is not my intention to make any, uh, in general terms, if you are a member of the Italian military in Italy, your relationship with the public may be somewhat controversial. This is obviously due to Italy's past linked to fascism. In fact, after World War II, the newly born Italian constitution repudiated the war. As we can see here from Article 11, 1946, Italy repudiates war as an offensive tool harming other people's freedom or as a tool to solve, to solve international controversies. 
The same constitution allows, however, the limitation of sovereignty that is necessary to guarantee justice and peace amongst nations, promoting and assisting international organizations with such aims. Keep this in mind, but the bottom line here is that uh, the country was so afraid of particularly a fascist comeback that uh, it wanted to limit uh, particularly armed forces. And uh, even if we do not want to get any uh, political or anything like that, but such concerns were somehow legitimate, especially during the, the 1970s, during the so-called strategy of tension, where the country experienced the links between armed forces, secret services, and neo-fascist groups. In 1970, for instance, there was an attempt of coup by Union Valerio Borghese, who was a former fascist officer during World War II, whose dream was to reestablish fascist dictatorship model, model from the type of military dictatorship that we had, for instance, in Greece or Spain at the time. This is important as for our discussion, because since that period, the Italian military has been mostly deployed abroad. Abroad, in cooperation with NATO, with and then with the European Union and uh, the, the United Nations. Italian armed forces have been taking part to peacekeeping operation, policing and training. As of today, Italian armed forces are stationed in more than 20 countries and uh, are taking part to almost 30 international operations. If we take a look at this map, we can see that the Italian military is, uh, is pretty much mostly located in Africa and the Middle East. When we do not have the time to delve into each uh, operation, but just for the sake of it, keep in mind that uh, the Italian military has been very active, for instance, in uh, peacekeeping operations in Lebanon and in southern Lebanon, particularly the Alpini, one of the most uh, important and respected corps from the Italian army has been deployed in Afghanistan. Italian soldiers are also stationed in Iraq. And uh, we are training police forces in the Palestinian territories and in Nigeria, for instance. Domestically speaking, Italian soldiers have been used, particularly in the aftermath of natural disasters. Uh, four years ago, we had a major avalanche in central Italy. Italian soldiers have been uh, uh, have been helping the the government and the affected population. During the summer, we usually have uh, very bad fires in the south. As you can see here, uh, helicopters uh, help and assist local forces to put out fires. Since uh, 2005, uh, we've had an operation called uh, Safe Streets, according to which uh, Italian soldiers uh, have been patrolling sensitive uh, venues uh, such as uh, train stations, uh, museums, uh, airports, uh, uh, ports, uh, uh, etc., vis-à-vis terrorism. Two years ago, the, the Morandi Bridge in Genova collapsed. Uh, and uh, once again, the Albini were sent to assist the local population. All of this, uh, coupled with uh, important uh, international missions, uh, have been uh, resulted, according to Eurispa's 2019 survey, into the favorable views by the Italian public. In fact, seven out of 10 participants, at least within the contours of the study at the time, viewed the Italian armed forces favorably. Therefore, there was a big shift between, uh, from 1946. Now, after, the, after everything that we said, is uh, the COVID-19 related crisis reshaping uh, such, uh, such views or is it reinforces them? Well, before we try to answer this question, what has the Italian army in particular done? First thing first, the Italian army has been sending more units. 
And therefore, as of today, Italy counts 22,000 operative units, including 1,200 vehicles and mobile units, 12 military facilities which were um, which which were turned into COVID-19 facilities, and uh, about 40 military doctors assisting the public. That said, uh, we have three main areas uh, in which uh, the military has uh, been helping the public very visibly. The first one is patrolling, then uh, medical assistance and vital transportation. As for patrolling, uh, the, uh, the military personnel has uh, pretty much extended uh, Operation Safe Streets by patrolling uh, more streets uh, especially outside big centers such as Milan, Turin, Genova, and Rome, and what we call the red areas, particularly in the region of Lombardy and Veneto, where the COVID-19 outbreak started. As already mentioned, the military has, uh, um, has provided the national health system with very vital assistance. This meant that the military has built field hospitals around the country. The one that we see here in the picture is uh, uh, in Piacenza. And uh, uh, as, uh, as I have already said, uh, a number of doctors and nurses have been sent to assist the many, the many cases of COVID-19. As uh, as uh, it is the case uh, in a number of uh, theaters uh, of operations, uh, bodies, uh, casualties uh, have to be taken out of, uh, uh, of the city, of, uh, uh, of, of the various places. However, during the crisis, uh, the public was not able to do so. Think that not even the closest relatives were allowed to say goodbye to their beloved ones. And therefore, as we can see here in uh, this picture here on the left, the military did so. And therefore, the, uh, uh, the Italian army has, uh, um, has taken care of the transportation of hundreds and hundreds of dead bodies, particularly in the city of Bergamo. And this was uh, specially revered and appreciated by the local population. Now, given everything that we said, it is evident that the, that the Italian military has been used as a tool for public health and security during, uh, during the COVID crisis, improving, once again, its own image. However, is this enough as for recruiting? Because we also have to keep in mind that uh, Arguably, just as in a number of Western countries, the Italian military has also suffered from low rates of recruiting. We don't know, but what we definitely know for sure, especially coming from a very high rank officers, is that there has been a lack of coordination and strategy with the central government. This has a risk of duplication, has a risk of not meeting the, the necessary resources that the country needs. And as for the military, there's a risk of overstretching. In fact, last but not least, there's also a concern as for safety of the very military. And uh, given everything that we said, uh, a pretty fair amount of uh, uh, the people from the public and also, also from the political domain has been arguing against what we've seen before. So against the, the international commitments that Italy has been embarking on. Why should we send our soldiers abroad when we need them here in the streets during the COVID-19 crisis? Well, unfortunately, we don't really have the answer to this, but uh, there's definitely more to come in the upcoming months, once again, as for the role of the Italian military. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome. It is no exaggeration to say that a new reality has dawned upon us since COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. My name is Sara Al-Mahri and I'm a PhD student at the School of Security Studies at King's College London. Thank you in advance for your questions and comments. Day in, day out, we've grown accustomed to a new normal in all aspects of life. Life past COVID-19 won't be the same as life pre-COVID-19. Cities, provinces, states, regional organizations, and international institutions have deployed all within their means to win this war. 
Some observers argue that controlling the virus means also controlling and often micromanaging individual people's lives. Welcome to this brave new world where COVID-19 rules supreme. The questions I want to briefly approach are these. What kind of role has the UAE military played in the COVID-19 pandemic? How has this role changed over the past weeks and months? How are civil military relations being affected by the COVID crisis? Thank you, Professor David Roberts, for organizing this timely event and for your kind invitation. Here is my roadmap. I start off with a few facts, figures, and comments about the coronavirus in the UAE. I then describe the extent of the UAE military involvement in the fight against the pandemic, both nationally and internationally. Finally, I try to make sense of the overall situation through two theoretical lenses, securitization theory and soft power theory. What I submit to you is that the military's role in the fight against Corona has mutated inside and outside the UAE. To give you a foretaste of the presentation, let me start off with a few facts and observations. First, presenting the coronavirus narrative not only is a health crisis, but also is a security threat, requiring more extraordinary measures than would otherwise be the case. It is a course of action pursued by many countries, including countries in the Middle East. Second, implicating the military in the war against Corona has generated a discourse characteristic of a warlike situation. Here are a few examples. Frontline defense, heroes, besieging the enemy, invisible enemy, enemy in infiltration, lockdown, state of emergency, national security threat, white army, medical war zone, etc. Finally, it is no secret that these states that have implemented stricter measures are the ones who have registered a higher degree of success. In the UAE, the state has gone as far as to pass laws targeting the circulation of rumors about COVID-19. Karasik 2020 argues that these laws are being rigidly enforced in order to keep civil control. I will elaborate on this point in the coming sections. Let me now speak to the scope of the UAE military action and the pandemic. This is the man at the helm, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and De Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces. I quote His Highness's speech dated May 6, 2020. This year, the 44th anniversary of that unification of our armed forces comes under exceptional circumstances at the international level because of the novel coronavirus pandemic, which we are facing together with the whole world. Various state institutions, including health, security, military, economic, voluntary, community, and others join forces to tackle the virus. The epidemic, with all its aspects and its connotations, reveals the significant transformations that have taken place and are attached to the concepts of national and international security. Many countries in the world, East and West, have resorted to the military in the war on the coronavirus and have countered it through their equipment, capabilities, and human cadres that are qualified and willing to deal with risks anywhere. At any time, it is the armed forces that always preserves the state as its ultimate refuge in times of crisis and distress. Please note the following in the speech. One, the strong association between the UAE, armed forces and the pandemic. Two, coronavirus is framed as an all encompassing national and international security threat. Three, the military and civil institutions together are deployed to combat the virus. Now, I would like to briefly list the measures taken by the UAE to mitigate the effect of the coronavirus. One, the UAE has developed a rapid coronavirus laser testing technology capable of detecting morphological changes in blood cells and identifying positive cases as soon as blood cells are infected. Two, a government restriction on movement from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., except for those with an exemption granted by government permit. This lockdown is a declaration of a state of emergency, meaning that a national security threat is perceived and acted upon. Three, the UAE Armed Forces carried out Operation Righteous Collaboration 12 with the Ministry of Interior and National Emergency Crisis and Disaster Management Authority to enforce COVID-19 health lockdown measures. Four, the UAE's blended military-civil approach to COVID-19, such as the military-medical 
civil defense program that involves a campaign that closes and disinfects mosques and Islamic facilities. It also involves a civil defense plan of the disinfection and decontamination program, and even training civilians to be part of the decontamination units to gradually ease the lockdown. Five, the UAE enforces confinement laws concerning in three ways. Abu Dhabi police declares intelligence systems and radars are now detecting and monitoring non-compliance with lockdown and are imposing fines in absentia. 15 coronavirus related laws are applied against non-compliant individuals with fines ranging from $200 to $27,000, including for refusing to take the test when requested and jail for up to six months for violators. The Emirati Technology Company Group 42 has launched its population genome program, which will provide rapid genotyping to help gather necessary data for researchers to develop a cure. The UAE has also deployed its soft and hard power and launches COVID-19 aid operations through airlifting operations and humanitarian initiatives worldwide. By May 21st, the UAE had provided more than 640 tons of medical aid to 55 countries, including the USA, under the banner UAE Homeland of Humanity Initiative. Two UN World Food Program field hospitals were transported by the UAE military from Norway to Ghana and Ethiopia, including the transportation of the WHO's medical supplies to Iran, Ethiopia, and Somalia. More than 80% of the international response to COVID was provided as assistance sent from Dubai's international humanitarian city to affected countries worldwide. There are two ways to consider the UAE's joint civil military action to ward off the pandemic. Securitization theory and soft power theory. Two points here. Soft power wise, provision of aid to institutions and states on a global scale has always been one of the UAE's privileged methods of building bridges with countries. It stands to reason that the military is deployed to this end. John Ricalta, U.S. ambassador to the UAE, wrote the following comment. In recent weeks, we have seen populations isolated and separated, causing understandable disruption, all in the interest of the greater good. At a moment like this, I would like to commend the government of the United Arab Emirates for leading in this time of crisis and for its close partnership with the United States of America. Moving on to securitization theory. Securitization thus means the elevation of an issue beyond the level of everyday politics. Coronavirus is framed not as a public health issue, but more like a security threat. Framing the coronavirus pandemic as a security threat is a strategic choice pursued especially by security conscious states in the Middle East. It is not simply a natural choice dictated by the severity of the crisis. Pushing the argument to its logical conclusions, Hoffman argues that elevating an issue to the rank of a national security threat means that the military is in charge and will do all it can to mitigate the impact of the threat. However, this act carries the potential of subjecting the population to more stringent controls and using the wartime powers to neutralize political opposition now and into the future. By way of illustration, Consider the recent mass protests in Spain demanding the government's resignation, having against their will kept the state of emergency in place to limit people's movement. So what? The Corona health crisis offers yet another opportunity for the UAE military to stand up and be counted, not just on the international level, providing aid to numerous countries, but also at the national level, countering the virus through its civil military defense model in a robust, organized, and scientific way. The UAE soft power strategy has now even shifted to focus on disease prevention through its aid programs of medical supplies. However, studies are yet to be conducted on the different types of dividends the UAE is likely to gain from this approach. According to Hoffman, it is unlikely that the wartime measures emerging after the coronavirus pandemic will be one where citizens are happier with the quality of governance or are more engaged in the political system. This is especially true for poorer countries where limited resources are being invested in the fight against Corona. The citizens of such countries may not be able to mobilize and protest in the short term, but long-term 
grievances may accumulate and citizens may engage in stronger protests against the imposition of wartime responses when the coronavirus is history. In my view, nationally, this scenario is extremely unlikely to unfold in the UAE because citizens and residents of the country know that these measures are imposed to protect them. And because the UAE state has always gone the extra mile to make sure the population's safety and prosperity are its top priority. Internationally, and as the crisis, uh, the coronavirus crisis worsens, affected states will turn to one another for support. And the UAE has already demonstrated it is willing to take this role using diplomacy and aid. Thank you all for listening. Martin, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm just uh, uh, sharing my slides. Excellent, thank just you. Give me a second. Uh, so, um, the impressive thing about all of those uh, presentations was the common themes um, across all of them, reflecting the way in which uh, each nation has uh, mobilized their military as part of their national resource and looked at how the military can utilize its non war fighting capabilities, uh, particularly in the provision of logistic and medical support to national responses. So this slide really lists the various ways that governments have used their generic military capabilities um, as part of their civil military response. And I think all of the presentations um, illustrated the different ways in which at national level, governments have incorporated their militaries into the planning cycle. And different countries have um, used that civil military relationship in different ways. Um, some have used existing crisis response systems, some have uh, created uh, unique uh, dedicated military organisations like in the UK, um, they've created the COVID-19 task force. And in some countries, uh, an example being Hungary, the military have actually taken over some uh, essential public or commercial services in order to ensure continuity of service. Perhaps the one thing that's not been so strongly highlighted is the challenge militaries have faced in maintaining key national security tasks, uh, including overseas operations. Uh, and has been one thing illustrated in the Ukraine example is that it's very difficult to manage uh, social distancing or other control measures when you're actually trying to fight a war. Uh, two very good examples of the challenges the US Navy and the French Navy have had uh, in running their aircraft carriers that have, been, that have been affected by COVID. So it's a very significant employment challenge for militaries uh, in how to protect their personnel and balance off the risk to individuals versus um, maintaining the mission. And then all of the presentations have uh, described different ways in which generic military capabilities have supported um, domestic resilience tasks uh, government planning, uh, repatriation of national citizens from overseas, uh, creation of quarantine centres for personnel coming back from overseas before they go back into uh, general public circulation. Uh, we've touched on logistics. One particular area is um, the use of military uh, scientific laboratories as part of the medical research programme. Uh, and that links to a number of countries' capabilities in conducting uh, research into chemical, biological or nuclear um, defence and then uh, translating that as part of national research capability in uh, scientific research against um, COVID. From a military medical role, um, again, depending on the size of the military medical services relative to the national uh, medical system, and also the balance between a national medical system controlled by government or um, sort of contracted by government through insurance systems. 
that's affected the precise ways in which civil military cooperation has happened uh, in the medical arena. Um, but in, in breaking it down by groupings, then um, uh, an example is air and medical evacuation. Firstly, uh, to bring patients back from overseas and also to move uh, patients between hospitals. Then um, augmenting civil medical capability with military resources. And we've seen examples of all of the ones uh, listed on my slide. I particularly want to highlight the importance of screening um, and the use of um, military in, in many countries to assist with screening patients as they arrive to hospital to separate out those that are uh, potentially infected with uh, COVID-19. And then finally, in a number of countries, the military has been used to reinforce public health, um, public health systems, both in setting up testing centers for um, COVID-19 and the general public, and also supporting track and trace measures um, so as to try to close down uh, localized outbreaks of COVID-19. So uh, there's the, both the list really uh, are generic lists and you can tick off nearly every single one of these activities in nearly every single country. And the scale in which the military has supported um, the civilian sector really depends on the uh, scale of the rest of the country's um, capabilities um, compared to the military. So, so in conclusion, I would suggest that um, this COVID-19 crisis has reinforced uh, the importance of generic health threats as a risk to both national and international security. And so that I think is going to change some of the discussions around how countries invest in uh, capabilities to protect them um, from this threat versus uh, threats of state warfare and other uh, more conventional security threats. And then we've looked at how the civil military relations within a country uh, supports crisis management and also resilience for mass casualty events. Uh, and not notably, NATO was already trying to think about civil military cooperation uh, in the event of um, more significant uh, war fighting activity um, from the threat from, from Russia or other state-based threats and how nations would respond to mass casualties, both in their armed forces, but also potentially in their publics. And then we've touched on some of the un unique military capabilities that have been utilized in response to this health crisis. And as I think um, was touched on um, in the discussion about Europe, the question for um, militaries looking into the future is the extent to which um, now they're going to have to protect their unique military medical capabilities as part of national response to, um, to crises beyond conventional security crises. Then we've touched on the, the challenge of maintaining military capability uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. And that in the medium term is in also going to include the challenge of how you conduct military training and train recruits um, in uh, the situation where you're going to have to maintain social distancing. Uh, and then finally, there's the challenge of balancing budgets and the implication for defence and security spending um, as a result of the, um, both the potential recession and also the need to pay for many of the um, economic mitigations that countries have put in place um, over this uh, short period of crisis. So I hope what I've managed to do is sort of summarize uh, the themes from the various presentations we've had about civil military relations. And I'll hand back over to David to uh, moderate the questions. Thank you so much, Anandi. Thanks to um, all the presenters for putting in all the work there. Uh, most appreciated. Um, in terms of the questions, if I could go directly back to Professor Bricknell uh, initially, and a similar question on to Dr. Nemeth, perhaps. So there have been a couple of questions grouped around the ideas of, you know, are there obvious examples of best practice we've seen in Europe? Um, instances within a, within a state or with, within different countries where there are easy identifiable instances of best practice 
what are they? Um, I, what are the lessons learned about this, uh, about transmitting these ideas? Do any obvious examples leap, leap to mind there? So Professor Bricknell and a similar issue, you could comment Dr. Nemeth as well, thanks. So I think the, the best example is uh, collaborative planning, uh, but ensuring that the military remains subordinate to the civil power. Uh, and we've seen that uh, um, in generic terms at the national government level across most of the European uh, democracies. And then at very local level, uh, so in the UK and in many countries, we've seen very good local civil military cooperation whereby both parties have brought um, their skills together in a way that delivers very rapid um, incremental change. Perhaps the best example of that in the UK was the, um, the, the building of the Nightingale hospitals and civil military collaboration um, during that uh, very challenging mission that was set. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you. So yes, the, 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 I see the question from the Q&A and, and um, it also asked that uh, which logistical medical capabilities uh, would be the useful and from which countries. I, so my impression about the dynamic here is that the armed forces really wanted to show off that, uh, that we, can, we can contribute to this crisis. So, so it's, uh, it is not necessarily about uh, which was the most useful, I think, but uh, what the, the armed forces could offer for the civil authorities. So it depended uh, on, on different countries, but, but I think, and this is the reason why I mentioned the airlift capabilities, these were the, I think the most uh, Visible ones, of course, uh, uh, logistic um, kind of tasks. Most of them were done not uh, with airlift capabilities, but on, on roads by trucks. Uh, but uh, but in terms of bringing uh, people home from abroad, and and if uh, uh, urgent care were needed uh, for different patients, these airlift capabilities were very very useful to to provide uh, uh, very quick help. To those people and uh, to those uh, hospitals that uh, that uh, needed this, so I think uh, these were the most uh, kind of um, um, visible ones. And as uh, Professor Britner mentioned, I think the other uh, very kind of visible um, capability was that the public realized that uh, the militaries are able to build field hospitals in a very short period of time, and we could see this in numerous countries. That it happened also in in, uh, in Croatia or or it was mentioned in Italy, Spain, France, Germany, Belgium, so in many many countries, uh, the the military were there. So I think these two uh, capacities or capabilities were the most visible and I think the most appreciated by the public. Thanks very much. Um, if I could come to um, Maritza and then to Dr. De Groppi, there are questions here about you know the impact on civil military relations going forward. Um, you know, with the, with the countries, with the other countries involved as well, we are at different stages of democratic development, if you see what I mean. And so what are your impressions as to the impact of this right at the moment? How has it affected the trajectory of civil military relations? So Maritza, perhaps if you could uh, answer that first, and then uh, Dr. Groppi uh, subsequently, thank you. Maritza, you're on mute. Um, what I can say is in the case of Colombia and Brazil, uh, all the activities like arm and non-arm activities are covered, are covered already in the constitutions uh, and in all the internal laws uh, in both countries. So I, I, I cannot see like too much risk to harm the, the, the democracy. And also, um, the population is used to see the the work of the militaries inside their countries. So sure, sure. Dr. Grappi, any thoughts? Yeah, I uh, thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Um, I think that here in Italy, obviously, we are uh, at a very different stage uh, uh, of the pandemic, uh, and uh, generally speaking, uh, also the civil military relationship, right? But uh, as I said in the presentation, uh, um, it is my thought that uh, this, uh, this crisis uh, has actually improved uh, the image of the military. Uh, 
because obviously the uh, the armed forces uh, have been helping uh, the police uh, have been helping the hospitals uh, and so they have provided the public with a certain amount of assistance will this be enough to answer the systemic challenges that the italian armed forces uh, regularly face meaning recruitment meaning lack of resources i think not actually but just as for the public uh, uh, I think that uh, that, that this uh, uh, is actually going to help in a, in a way or the other. Thanks very much. And to be honest, I'm quite interested in the, the same kind of a question to to Natasha and to Sarah. So again, we have different states at different stages of their sort of co-development of civil military relations, if you wish. How do you think that this crisis will indeed affect the trajectory? Um, you've got a very, and Natasha first perhaps, you've got a very unique state there, as you mentioned, you, you're very nice to introduce. And Sara, of course, we have a much younger state in the UAE with the military rising in prominence, if you see what I mean. Again, what are the effects on this, do you think? So Natasha and Sara, please. Hi, thanks, Dr. Robert. Um, I have to agree with Dr. Bricknell, actually, that um, collaboration is going to be the biggest thing here. We're going to see a lot more buildup um, between local authorities and the military and um, collaboration on that front. And I think just in general, we're going to see a lot more civil military um, just working together and the military working to help secure the Eastern Front and working with the people on the front lines there. Sure, thanks. Sarah? Well, um, it looks as though that the best practices are easily reversed um, after any crisis uh, happens like this. For, for example, and if we remember the Second World War. Sorry, it slipped onto mute. Sorry, if you're on mute, it's slipped on by mistake. Hello? Oh, yes, you, it, it slipped onto mute. If you could just repeat just a, a few seconds, thanks. Uh, well, wartime uh, practices that usually appear during the crises are missions. Second World War, yeah. I think we're having a couple of connection issues. Um, f forgive me, Sarah, for, for, for scooting on. Um, Dr. Nemeth, there's a question sort of uh, posted at you here. Um, this idea of you, you refer to reducing expeditionary expenses, for example, in militaries. Did you have any specific ideas as to sort of what you were referring to there, to elaborate perhaps? No, I, it, it depends. So there is a difference with your strategy making, of course, uh, uh, what is happening that the different services and branches are going to fight for their capabilities. And I, I don't have anything uh, specific in my mind, but the trajectory is really clear for the last five years that that expeditionary war fighting and peacekeeping is becoming relatively less relevant compared to previous uh, uh, times, uh, compared to the 90s or the 2000s or the 2010s. Tens, and more um, kind of tasks related uh, uh, helping the civilian authorities regarding different uh, issues, like I mentioned, um, migration crisis, uh, terrorist attacks, and now the COVID-19 crisis, uh, it, it shows that the relative importance of, of, of the warfighting capabilities are decreasing. It doesn't mean that they go away, so they still will be the biggest chunk uh, in, the, in the budget probably, but, but uh, probably the uh, medical capabilities, uh, logistic capabilities, and for instance, CBRM capabilities will be relatively more important. So I don't have anything in mind, but we can see that, that, that uh, for instance, here in the UK or France or in most countries, those uh, positions uh, abroad in, in operations that were not uh, absolutely necessary to be filled, they were kind of canceled and many, many military officers and many military troops were, were, were brought home. So, it is already happening that the, the footprint of European armed forces are decreasing in different theaters uh, in general, but I don't have anything in my mind. Probably the difference review will determine this. Sure, thanks very much. Dr. Groppi, this is like a, it's a general question, really, not necessarily specifically focused on Italy, but I'd be interested in your thoughts about, 
you know, we're in a new world now. Everyone's budgets are under enormous pressure. I mean, how do you see militaries using, if that's the right word, um, the COVID um, sort of crisis and their role to fight for budget now? Uh, or can it be leveraged in that way? Do you think that's likely? And so to Dr. Garoppi, perhaps, and then Professor Bricknell, if you'd take on a similar sort of a question, that'd be interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Uh, this is actually a very difficult question because uh, Italy, just many other countries, uh, is facing uh, severe economic repercussions uh, as for the COVID-19 crisis. Therefore, the military has been uh, uh, pretty much crying uh, for a number of years, right? Uh, they are saying we don't have resources, we don't have men, we don't have money. Uh, as you know, I do counterterrorism and uh, having uh, discussions with the very high uh, ranked uh, officers in the army. They have been saying this for years, like, yes, we would love to do certain things and we're, and, and we're not able to do that because we're lacking personal, because we're lacking technology, because we're lacking money. Blah, blah, blah. This situation, unfortunately, is going to exacerbate something like this. Uh, and in fact, uh, as you said in the presentation, uh, a large segment uh, of the political sphere has even been arguing for the restructuring of the army, not expeditionary forces. Uh, we don't care or we should not care about uh, our international commitments. We should just focus uh, on domestic uh, uh, on domestic tasks, right? The disaster relief, uh, pandemics, etc. Uh, and therefore, we just have to spend less and be smarter about it. Is this going to affect the, uh, once again, like recruiting uh, funds? I, <laughs> I suspect so, actually, and it does not look good. Professor, thanks. Thank yeah. you very much. So, so I certainly agree from a Europe, European NATO perspective that um, the focus has shifted from expeditionary operations, probably more towards collective defense rather than um, internal sort of national disaster response. But I do think that um, our nation's militaries have been um, making a very concerted effort to make sure that they are, they are relevant to domestic public opinion, as well as conducting overseas military operations. And certainly I would argue that um, many countries have, or many countries' militaries have used this as an opportunity to um, confirm to both their governments and their populations the role of their military as part of um, national resilience capabilities. And so um, in, the, in the budgetary challenges that we're all going to face, I, I would not be surprised if all ministries of defense will be arguing how vital they have been in uh, the response to this. I guess the, um, the biggest unknown is the change in, the, um, in international relations and uh, particularly in regard to countries that could be argued have, um, have weaponized COVID for um, international politics and therefore whether you still need to have externally facing security actors that can address that component of um, this health threat, and which would more naturally for, uh, lie to you know, the intelligence agencies and the, uh, and the military agencies, rather than you know, ministries of, of um, health in, in a domestic country. So I think um, in the scrabble for um, budgetary settlements, um, you know, all militaries will be trying to at least defend their position on the basis of how they have contributed to national response during this crisis. Thank you. Thanks very much. Maritza and Natasha, it, the, your case studies are sort of similar in, in a way, I think, in that the role of the militaries um, in, in your cases has been far more overt in many ways, far more sort of quote unquote useful, if you see what I mean. They've done something very specific very recently, I, I, if you see what I mean, as opposed to um, Italy perhaps, where the, the overt role of the military in recent years has been a bit more amorphous, if you see what I mean. And so bearing that in mind, I mean, you know, how do you see this going forward? The, 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 have the militaries been able to leverage what they've been doing with COVID to their advantage? Again, picking up on Professor Bricknell's points and so on. 
um, again, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of trajectories going forward. Uh, Maritza, forgive me, and then Natasha, my apologies. Okay, thank you. Um, well, what I think is, uh, like in both countries, the militaries are used to, and in this case, this is public health. Uh, they are both in both countries in Colombia and Brazil. They are used to make tasks related um, mm -hmm. with this. So what what is what is changing in the in this moment is how to manage a pandemic, because this is new, not not just for uh, Colombia and Brazil, but for everyone. But the fact of them manage something in public health is already inside their task. So in my case, what I think, what I think is what, it need, what needs to be changed is the theory. Because civil military, when you, when you talk about civil military relations, uh, it's, it's not as close as it means uh, in Colombia and Brazil, like the relation between the military and the civilian population. So this is what I think that it, it, like, it should be like broadened. No stress, thanks so much. Uh, Natasha? Right, um, well, as you said, they're definitely playing a very active role um, right now in the Eastern Front and everything. And I think it's imperative going forward that they um, show as much strength as they can um, especially as I think I, at the very end of my presentation, I talked about how this could help them regain legitimacy in the region. So if they can provide like support, virus support to the separatists, even not the separatists themselves, but the areas of contention and somehow regain a little bit of that, I think it could do wonders um, both for the legitimacy of the government, but also the capabilities of the military and um, potentially we could see a more unified Ukraine come out of this. I know the um, government also has done a whole overhaul and the Ministry of Defense is very um, pro-military, proactive. They're pro-international integration. Um, they're relying a lot on NATO and the um, civil response sector of that. Sure. So I think, yeah, no, I think going forward, we'll, we'll see a lot of maybe even modernization in their civil military relations and um, a, a very active military presence. Sure, thanks. Um, Sarah, um, if you're um, still with us, um, I'm interested in, I mean, the time is pressing. So a quick reflection perhaps on maybe a comparative perspective within the Gulf of comparing the UAE, what have they done with their military with COVID a bit differently? Um, and or I'm also interested in what has changed within the UAE because of, as you mentioned very sort of expertly, I think, the Emirati military role within the civil response. So has there been a shift within the UAE to the engagement with the military? If you're with us, Sarah. I think we might have uh, pushed our technological luck with, um, with Sarah there, uh, forgive me. Um, more generally, um, I might come to each of you in turn for a, for a closing um, comment or two. Um, pull together any threads uh, that you're interested in, that you've picked up, reflect comparatively, whatever it might be. Uh, I might come to uh, Dr. Nemeth first, then Professor Bricknell, Maritza, uh, last but very much not least, uh, Natasha. Dr. Nemeth, if you're with us. Yeah, thank you. So I, th I think, uh, yes, we touched it a little bit that how the COVID-19 crisis will affect uh, the future of armed forces. And we can see that, that especially in Europe, most countries will accumulate a huge amount of debt. So probably we will see austerity measures in the coming years. And, and it seems that the militaries will not be able to escape this either. Um, so we will see probably most likely that uh, capabilities will be reduced and um, and uh, it will be very difficult for the, uh, and it is the reason why I said that probably the war fighting capabilities will have a, a smaller chance to maintain uh, the argument because because when you see a, a headline that then there will be millions of unemployment in different countries in Europe and, and if, if a military will argue that I need new tanks or new submarines when millions are unemployed that will be, uh, I mean, I think it will be not uh, uh, a good 
kind of picture for Demetrius. So I agree with uh, Professor Bricknett that the argument has to be made that we contributed to the to the COVID-19 crisis with different capabilities. It is the reason why I think that those capabilities that that the, the armed forces could show for the public will will be even more important for the militaries to sell themselves and sell their strategies in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much. I've forgotten the order I suggested. Was it Professor Bricknell, Maritza, and Natasha, perhaps? I think I was coming next, yeah. Happy so, so I think that um, this will pose us some real questions on what, what is national power. And um, all, all um, sort of Northern Hemisphere countries have been heavily concentrating on internal security in the, in the short term to address the threat of COVID. But actually, as, as we look to the future, I think we're also going to have to think about um, that as applied to the international system, particularly as COVID sort of takes root in more um, vulnerable countries, the more vulnerable populations, uh, and I would say particularly in Africa. And um, as Sarah touched on uh, UAE's use of soft power in supporting other countries, and we've definitely seen China and Russia to an extent use soft power um, uh, to challenge um, the West, sort of Western Northern Hemisphere perspective as well. So I, I think the biggest question will be what is, what is our role in uh, both nationally and, and in international groupings in shaping the international system? And what, how much can we afford to invest, invest in global health diplomacy? using both civil and military relations uh, in the global arena. And I think this will also touch on the, the differing perspectives of civil military relations from a national perspective in disaster response and civil military relations in a complex humanitarian response. And, and I think um, you know, we, we perhaps need to sort of consolidate the notion that, that a country and a state functions effectively when civil and, and security society is able to collaborate together uh, in order to meet the needs of its populations. And so, I, you know, to a very large extent, almost all of sort of international theory, defense theory, security studies theory uh, will be to a certain extent thrown up in the air and we'll see how it lands as these new debates evolve. Thank you. Always nice to get some uh, security studies theory in there somewhere. That's for, for another day, I think. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Maritza, please. Okay, so I have like three ideas. So the first one uh, is like a pandemic, a pandemic is a risk for national security. Uh, the second one, civil military relations are going to change. Uh, uh, because with the example that we see around all the countries that they are using the, the, the military. So maybe the, um, the, the way to the citizens to see the military, the, it will change. Uh, and the third idea is we have to be careful with the politicization of the military. So we need to study that. <laughs> Plenty of work for us to do. We won't be out of business anytime soon. Good to hear. Um, thanks so much. Uh, Natasha. I think um, for me coming out of this is just how the disparity between regions specifically is going to change so vastly um, because of the COVID-19. So Eurasia is going to look very, very different to South America. Not that it doesn't already, but just I think it's going to grow even more and we're going to have to really see how international relations kind of play a part in reopening the world almost, you know, instead of reopening countries individually, it's going to be really interesting to just see how militaries work, not only within their countries, but how they're integrating, you know, um, through international organizations, through peacekeeping efforts, and just how each country is going to kind of play a part um, in their region, and sort of reopening the regions as well as just globally. Um, yeah, and I think that that's pretty much my my part in this. So thank you so much for having us all. No, thank you so much. Um, one last try out to the UAE. Sarah, any chance you're with us? Um, can offer a closing uh, thought or two? Hello? Technol can you hear Sarah, 
yes, you have a, a, a quick minute if you want to offer okay. us a quick closing reflection or thought, perhaps. Great. So um, basically, I think that the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, has definitely created um, like a set to influence a society in, in many significant ways, um, ranging, uh, ranging from uh, healthcare to the economy, to our lifestyles, to the militaries. Um, I know it may be too early to predict what the post-coronavirus landscape will look like, but um, the geopolitical implications, um, I think they will prove consequential in the long term. Um, in terms of, uh, I think also uh, from a foreign policy perspective, the UAE will definitely need to prepare for whatever changes uh, may come along. Happy days. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so um, I'll bring, a, bring that to a close. So um, first and foremost, thank you to the speakers. They've done all the hard work. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, we didn't get around to all the questions, so my apologies there. Um, I need to say thanks to the comms team as well, frantically helping me out throughout this, so most appreciate it. Um, stick around this week. There's plenty of other things going on at King's. Uh, defense and diplomacy, risk resilience, uh, ethics, security, health, grand strategy, all sorts, I suspect, going on. Uh, these individual presentations will be up on our website fairly soonish. And Natasha's also written a blog post for us as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you all so much. Um, cheers. <laughs>